you have a NeuroPixel probe and you can see the shank here, then you can see what is called the base, basically the chip, um, and then a flex cable. Um, to and go then a bit, a bit lower. A bit lower. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, it's hard because I can't actually see. But um, so a flex cable. <laughs> um, can you guys see? All right. Uh, a head stage. Um, and as you can see, uh, one of the really nice features of NeuroPixel probes is that it has a really small footprint. So my uh, finger for scale, you can really easily insert a lot of probes simultaneously. And I think the record is eight or nine, which is quite a lot. And then all of the signal is amplified, digitized, um, and filtered on base. And the signal comes out from one single uh, cable, which is really nice. This cable then sends all your recording data over here. So this is a chassis. Can you see this? Yes, you can sort of see. <laughs> this is a chassis. Um, and the signal is sent to these PXIE cards. And you can record four probes in one card. And you can have two of these cards per chassis. So you can record eight probes simultaneously with this setup. And here you can also input any signal that you like if you wanted to use this to align your data. So here we have signal from a random uh, sort of clock um, is generated and sent here on this card and is going to be recorded simultaneously with our EFIS data. And this then allows us to align all our data. The card can also emit a signal itself that you could then send to a dock or whichever device you wanted to. Um, then via another um, PXIE, a PXIE controller and this cable, which is called an MXI cable, the data is sent to your um, EFIS computer, which you can hopefully sort of see here. Um, and so for this, you need a spare PCIe 8x um, slot. But so basically this um, is sent to your computer and you can then record your data. So when everything is good, you have a green light over here on your card. And this means that uh, you will be able to record your data. And you can do this with several softwares, one of which is Spike GLX. Josh Siegel will talk a little bit more in detail about the other big software, which is Open EFIS. So I'm just going to show you what things look like on Spike GLX. So if you open Spike GLX, um, things look like this. And here we have one probe, which is in um, a particular location, a slot and port, which is um, detected. And this then allows us to choose which channels you would want to record from, which you choose with something called an IMRO file, which defines which channels you can record from. With the NeuroPixel probes, there are three banks of channels of 384 channels that you can choose to record from. Um, and you can then view your data, hopefully. Um, so here the probe, there's a bunch of noise. The probe isn't in the brain or anything like that. It looks like a few sites um, aren't great. Uh, and then you can start recording um, your data and you can choose how you want to view your data, um, changing the scaling, for instance. And when you do this, you will get on your chassis a blue light that indicates that you are um, recording your data. Um, okay, so that is an overview of the basic setup that you would have for a new pixel probe. It's a quite small setup. So the probe itself is quite small and um, all the elements together have a very small footprint and it fits easily in a rig. Um, and I'm now gonna let Josh Siegel continue. All right, uh, thanks a lot. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about the Open EFITS GUI, which is collaboratively developed software for high channel count electrophysiology experiments. 
So the primary support team for Open EFIS consists of two full-time engineers based at the Allen Institute. And the source code includes contributions from 46 people all over the world. Um, the core application is cross-platform, but the NeuroPixels plugin currently only works on Windows, although we do have a Linux version in the works. So the distinguishing feature of the GUI relative to other software in this domain is its plugin architecture. So all of the data is handled by plugins that are compiled separately from the main application. This makes it easy to customize your processing pipeline for different experiments or use the same signal chain with a variety of different data sources. Uh, the GUI can currently acquire signals from the Open EFIS acquisition board, uh, Intan acquisition systems, most NeuroPixels, uh, sorry, most National Instruments DAC cards. Um, but of course, today we're going to focus on how to use it with NeuroPixels probes. So when you launch the GUI for the first time, uh, it displays a pop-up window that allows you to select one of three different default configurations. Um, there's one default configuration for the Open EFIS acquisition board, one for reading pre-recorded data, and one for NeuroPixels probes. Um, when we load the NeuroPixels configuration, it automatically downloads and installs the NeuroPixels PXI plugin, uh, which now appears to the in the processor list on the left. And uh, we don't have NeuroPixels hardware hooked up at the moment, so we're going to run the plugin in simulation mode. So click yes here. Um, and once the signal chain loads, you can see the plugins that were added in the editor viewport at the bottom of the window. And then we switch to the graph view. Where we can see all of the data streams that are being handled. Um, the NeuroPixels plugin generates two data streams, one for the AP band and one for the LFP band. And these propagate through the rest of the, the signal chain uh, into the record node, which writes the data and the LFP viewer, which is used for visualization. Now we'll switch to the NeuroPixel settings interface. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, we have a visualization of the probe that can be used to scroll through all of the 960 available electrodes, see which ones are active. Uh, if we select a subset and hit enable, it will activate the selected electrodes while deactivating the other electrodes near the tip that are connected to the same set of channels. The interface in the, the center allows you to change the AP band gain, the LFP band gain, or switch the reference between external and tip. Uh, if we activate the probe signal view and start acquisition, we can now visualize data as a heat map along the length of the probe. And obviously, this is simulated data, but if this were a real experiment, it would allow you to view the relative amplitude of these signals uh, across active electrodes. So let's pause acquisition and open up the plugin installer um, it's accessible via the file menu. This brings up a list of additional plugins that are available to download. So uh, we can scroll through this and then we're going to select the NeuroPixels car plugin, which is a common average reference that's optimized for use with NeuroPixels probes. So we can drop this into the signal chain uh, and it automatically detects the type of probe that's sending it data. So it knows which channels are sampled simultaneously. And it's important to consider the location of this plugin in the signal chain. If it's placed to the right of the record node like it is now, then the common average reference will only affect data that's uh, visualized in the LFP viewer. But if we now place it to the left of the record node, the, the GUI will save the data after it's been processed by the common average reference. Um, in most cases, though, uh, we recommend not placing any filters between a source node and a record node. And this way, the raw data coming out of the NeuroPixels plugin will be written directly by the record node. Uh, and then the, the common average reference will only affect the visualization. And if you want, you can always insert additional record nodes at other points in the signal chain. All right, uh, so yeah, before we talk about real-time visualizations, uh, delete the NeuroPixels plugin and replace it with a file reader so we can load some pre-recorded NeuroPixels data. And now we will hit play to start acquisition. And yeah, now we can see data streaming in through the LFP viewer. Uh, we can scroll through it a, a little bit. Um, we can split the display vertically to visualize different segments of the probe at the same time. Uh, we can split the display horizontally uh, to visualize a, a single channel uh, while we scroll through the rest of the data. Um, and then, yeah, let's change the display into spike raster mode by first setting a threshold of minus 50 microvolts, then uh, changing color scheme to monochrome, um, changing the time base to four seconds, reversing the channel order, 
skipping every fourth channel and then uh, changing the channel height to six pixels. And now we can visualize spikes across the entire length of the probe as a raster. And another visualization that works well with NeuroPixels is the probe viewer. Uh, so we can drop this to the left, uh, uh, sorry, to the right of the LFP viewer. And uh, this will allow us to view our, our voltage traces as a, a heat map over time. Uh, we can expand the channel range a little bit and uh, scroll up across the length of the probe. So this particular recording uh, has uh, channels in cortex up here, uh, hippocampus in the middle, and, and thalamus at the bottom. Uh, we can also expand the display to visualize the whole probe at once. So now let's drop a spike detector plug in to the right of the probe viewer, uh, set the number of spike detection electrodes to 100, and then hit the plus button to create these. Um, and then we can hit control A to select all the electrodes and switch to an automated thresholding method that's based on the standard deviation of the incoming signals. Um, and yeah, we can use this interface to easily adjust the threshold for, for all of the electrodes at once. Um, and then, yeah, we'll let's add a spike viewer, start acquisition again, and now we can see the spike waveforms across all of these electrodes. Um, in a second, the thresholds will adjust automatically. Um, there you see they, each one is uh, now customized to the individual electrode. Uh, we can decrease the display size so we can view more electrodes simultaneously. Um, and yeah, the last thing I want to show is uh, if we want to send info about these spikes to another piece of software, uh, we can add an event broadcaster to the signal chain. And now all of these spikes can be accessed in real time in MATLAB or Python, uh, either on the same machine or, or over a network connection. So that was a lot of info, but the uh, presentation is being recorded, so you can refer, refer to it later. And uh, everything I showed you is also covered in the online documentation. So I want to talk briefly about the default data format used by the GUI, known as the, the binary format. So it stores continuous data as DAT files, which are exactly the same as Spike GLX bin files and can be loaded directly by most spikes orders. Uh, events and timestamps, on the other hand, are stored in NumPy files, which are easy to read in either Python or MATLAB, um, and all metadata is stored in standard JSON files. And since you can record data at any point in the signal chain, uh, there will be a separate directory for each record node, and then new experiment directories are created every time you stop and restart acquisition, which resets the hardware timestamps. Uh, and then new recording directories are created when you just start and stop recording so that the timestamps will be consistent between those directories. Um, and inside each uh, continuous events or spike directory, uh, data is stored according to streams, which are sets of channels that are sampled uh, synchronously. Um, so there will be separate directories for the AP band stream and the LFP band stream for, for NeuroPixels probes. Um, and then in, inside each of these directories, you'll find the continuous.dat file, which holds the, the raw or process data, uh, as well as the a NumPy file indicating the sample numbers since the start of acquisition, and a file that holds the global timestamp in, in seconds for each sample. Uh, the GUI can automatically synchronize data from different streams in real time, uh, which will prevent the need to align timestamps offline. I also want to mention one other unique feature of the GUI, which is its ability to perform closed loop feedback experiments. So one of the, the first use cases for OpenEFA's GUI was stimulating the hippocampus at specific phases of the theta oscillation in mice that were performing a working memory task. Um, there are now a variety of other plugins that can trigger outputs on events such as hippocampal ripples and, and seizure-like activity. And if a plugin doesn't exist for your desired use case, uh, you can either build it yourself or stream data to Python or, or MATLAB and, and perform real-time analysis there. And finally, I want to mention that the latest version of the GUI has a number of changes that make it even easier to use with NeuroPixel probes, uh, including uh, enhanced support for asynchronous data streams. So um, this makes it much easier to update settings on a probe-by-probe probe basis and allows you to automatically synchronize data across streams, uh, improve spike detection and display, which I, I showed you briefly, um, this can efficiently process spikes across all 384 channels of a NeuroPixels probe. Uh, there's now a built-in HTTP, HTTP server, uh, which allows you to control the GUI over a network. Um, you can start and stop acquisition or even change NeuroPixels probe settings remotely. Um, there's also a simplified API for creating plugin user interfaces that should make plugin development uh, much, much more intuitive. Um, so to try out these features for yourself, you can head over to openepis.org to download the GUI, 
And all the code is, of course, open source and hosted on GitHub. And to learn more about all the features I talked about, you can read the documentation at uh, openefis.org slash GUI docs. Uh, sorry, openefis.github.io slash GUI docs.